Good morning, YouTubers. This is Steve Bradley, God's Wordsmith, coming to you from beautiful Payson, Arizona. And I'm talking today about hell and its biblical idea. Hell and why you really don't want to go there. That is the subject of today's teaching. Today I'm going to go with a short version, and the reason is there's a lot of material on this. More, actually, if you look only at Jesus' teachings than there is about heaven. Jesus talked more about hell than about heaven. It's not a pleasant subject, and you really don't want to go there, and you don't have to. In the past, sometime through the middle of the first century and almost all the way up to the middle of the 20th century, hell and eternal punishment were often the preacher's favorite topic. However, by the time I became a Christian, that's in 1963, even Bible-believing ministers were soft-peddling this concept, and the secular world was making it a joke. My own first pastor called hell a Christless eternity, and preachers and evangelists used lots of other euphemisms. The world outside of the church talked about hell as the hot place, and they joked about it. And they, and they all said, all my friends will be there. Now, this was nearly 60 years ago. This was the year JFK was murdered, November 1963. And since then, teachings about hell have been downplayed, sugar-coated, and in some Christian teachers' minds, it's outmoded and should not be taught at all. And finally, in other the of people's minds, it is said that a loving God would never send anyone to hell, so it's just basically dismissed entirely. And this is a tragedy, and you'll see why in a moment. Now, this really should be no surprise, because hell is kind of like cancer. It's for somebody else. Nobody wants to believe it could be their destination. However, it is absolutely the most important thing in life to know where you're going after you die. Jesus spoke more of hell and destruction than he did of heaven. And here are a couple of examples. In his first recorded teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, there were references to hell. Matthew chapter 5 verse 22 says, whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of the hell fire, that is the Gehenna of fire. Matthew 5.30, and if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. This tells us that Jesus believed in hell. He often spoke of it. He never presented it as a nice place or a place you could go and enjoy eternity in any fashion whatsoever. It's a terrible place. Hell is called a lot of things in the New Testament, and not one of them is euphemistic. That is, not one of them soft pedals the idea. Sometimes it's given a descriptive name. It's called outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. At other times, it's given a name like destruction. It's presented as one of the only two places mankind goes after death. There are never more or fewer than two. It is called the second death. And a few other places in the book of Revelation, other than Revelation 20:14, it's called all kinds of terrible things. Sometimes hell is merely called death in contrast to life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is used in opposition to heaven, the kingdom of God, 
and similar statements. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46, it's called two things, everlasting fire reserved for the devil and his angels and everlasting punishment, and it's contrasted completely to eternal life. To summarize, hell is horrible, it's permanent, it's inescapable once you're there, and you do not want to go there. Jesus' most explicit example of hell is in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. And that reads this way. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously, that means he ate a lot, every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And here is his future. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented, and beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then the rich man said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that Lazarus may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And the rich man said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But Abraham said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Now Luke 16, 19 to 31 is representative of the interim state between the final judgment and the lake of fire. It's also a lake of fire. And Revelation 20 reveals what that lake of fire really is. A powerful statement, it is also a powerful statement about what happens immediately after death. Every evil person, Everyone who rejects Jesus Christ and refuses to repent spends the time between death and the final judgment just exactly as he will spend eternity. This is also a terrible reminder of the reversal of status. Karma is so terrible sometimes, and the beggar was unimportant, uncared for on earth, he was laid at the rich man's gate. The dogs licked his sores. He was just begging for something to eat. The rich man, so popular, so powerful on earth, was reduced to namelessness. He didn't even have a name in hell. And he was reduced to worthlessness so that not even a former beggar could attend to him and reduce his suffering. This is a terrifying example of what happens when one assumes that things will always be this way. I will always be rich. I will always be powerful. I will always be happy. That guy will always be a beggar. He's suffering, but that's just how it is. Death changes everything. Death reveals destiny. Death is not the big sleep. It's conscious, it's infinite joy, or infinite suffering. It's the fulfillment of the choices you make now. So let's unpack this story a bit 
but first I want to offer up a bit of explanation. Some commentators suggest that Jesus had particular people in mind, perhaps people that his audience knew. Jesus does not use names in parables. They're all impersonal. This is personal. Now, I also realize that I'm conflating some of the teachings on hell. There is so much material on hell. It's a bit difficult to separate out, and it would take a long time. This sermon is going to be long enough anyway. It would take a long time to separate it all out. So the basic mode of separation amongst theologians is chronological because there is a development of revelation on this topic, so I could give you that history. That would be a long version. However, Jesus' teachings offer up to us much of what we know about hell, and John in the book of Revelation completes it, so I'm going to give you the main message. Hell is a particular place. That's the first thing about it. It is not a state of mind. The only hell is here on earth, say some. Well, good luck with that. It's not true. Hell is also not a state of being. Hell is a place real people go after they die. Hell is where we find the rich man, Abraham's bosom, which is another place is where Lazarus is. And by the way, this is the same as paradise in other places in the New Testament. We will see later what sort of a place hell is, and it's not fun. Hell is a place of inf infinite contrasts. The rich man, we are told, died and was buried. Note now that he is unnamed. That's the opposite of his life on earth. And being in torments in Hades, that is hell, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And an additional point here is that the rich man sees what the blessings are from afar off. Now I am all but certain that Abraham is quoting the rich man's words back to him. Something like, I have my good things, said the rich man, and the beggar has his evil things. That's just life. That's the way it is. The beggar deserves what he got. And the rich man says, or implies, I deserve what I have. That's all true until those positions are reversed, and they will be. Hell is a place of fire and, in, and inexpressible torment. Now, it's customary today to attempt to make this infinitely horrible place less than it is. However, the rich man says, I am tormented in this flame. And the book of Revelation calls that fire and brimstone, which is burning sulfur. Now, sulfur burns and releases poison gas at 600 and something degrees Fahrenheit. It's hot. And it's never going to end. And I cannot express how desperately you do not want to go there. No matter what you think now, hell is real and it's coming. And I beg you, do not decide to go there. It is really your decision. Hell is inescapable. Once you're there, it's permanent. The rich man begs for a little relief. There is none. And Abraham says, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, 
nor can those from here pass to us. It is a place you cannot ever leave once you're there. There is no parole, no probation, no release, never. This life is your only opportunity to decide. That's the clear implication. Now the rich man says two things that tell us this. Number one, he obviously did not have a second chance after he died. No second chances, folks. Two, he begs Abraham to send Lazarus to his five brothers to tell them about hell. They would have no chance after death. Abraham refuses. Jesus' last words on this provide a horrible implication. If they won't listen to Moses, they won't listen if one rises from the dead. And that, of course, is just what Jesus did. He rose from the dead. And the Pharisees, as before, did not listen. The Apostle John sees what hell really is. That is the final hell. John says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. There was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, final, permanent, forever. And then take note of this, and anyone who was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Those are some of the most awful words in Scripture. It is a place you do not want to go. There is literally nothing worse than this. Hell is the lake of fire. It is the second death. It is the other side of God's love. It is his wrath. God is merciful. God is good. But he is also a God of judgment. And God's wrath, folks, like his love, is infinite. There are no second chances to change your mind. Once you die, that's it. I cannot emphasize enough that this is the worst thing that can happen to you. However, you can decide not to go there. And you can decide that today. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is a choice you make. It's your decision. Jesus said, my sheep, that is my people, hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone rip them out of my hand. And then he says in another place, everyone who comes to me, I will never cast out. And he also says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. He will never go to hell. Everyone who believes in Jesus Christ is exempted. Now, it's quite simple, folks. You can belong to Jesus Christ today. Many theologians reject the idea that Jesus Christ is now alive and in heaven. Well, they're wrong. Jesus Christ lives today, since his resurrection about 2,000 years ago. And he willing, re willingly receives, as the king of the universe, everyone who comes to him. And everyone who is willing to receive him as Lord and Savior. Now, folks, life and salvation involve a simple prayer. Paul tells us, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be, hate, shall be saved from death, hell, destruction. And so, what you would do is you would just say in your heart to the Lord, 
Lord Jesus, I want to belong to you and have eternal life. I don't understand much about Christianity, but I want to belong to you and be a Christian. That's it, if you mean it. It's not something you say lightly because it involves later a complete change in your life. But if you want to not go to hell, you pray that prayer. What's most wonderful about this is that Jesus did not restrict his offer to the good people. Jesus said in one place that prostitutes and the tax collectors go into the kingdom of God before you, you being the good people of the day. The bad people go into heaven. The good people don't. Why? Because they weren't really good. They weren't the kind of good that God makes them. They weren't the kind of good that received Jesus Christ and follows him. Jesus said to the thief being cru crucified next to him, today should, you shall be with me in paradise. A man who is being executed for his crimes and Jesus go to paradise together. Why? Because the man said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's enough. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says, Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. That's pretty much a catalog of everyone. However, if you look at the next verse, or the verse after next, 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says, And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. In other words, Jesus is the Savior for the worst of us, as well as for the best of us. Your history does not matter. Jesus does. There are some people who cannot go to heaven. <clears throat> Number one, those who reject Jesus Christ. John 3.36 says to us, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Those who refuse to repent and turn to God. The self-righteous who don't need a Savior, they can't go. Those who don't need God, just like Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man didn't need God. He had money. But then he died. Your wealth and power will not save you, folks. It may condemn you. Heaven, the kingdom of God, and eternity are coming at us fast. God is going to change everything in the world at large. What will you do? Where will you spend eternity? Are you the beggar or the rich man? What will happen to you at the judgment? It's coming. It doesn't matter whether you're ready. It's coming. And I beg you, choose heaven. God has written all these things down in his book so that we may choose the right path and fear the wrong path. I hope God blesses you with the full knowledge of him. This is Steve Bradley, God's Wordsmith, signing off.